I know it's been a while. A few of you might miss me. Many others of you probably don't. And that's okay. That's just fine by me. But I'm here either way. Let's talk about SummerSlam 2024. And my first reaction is, who's the rocket scientist that decided they wanted to schedule this during the Olympics? Like, really, who does that? Why would you have SummerSlam during the Olympics when even the streaming network that your premium live events appear on in Peacock is going to be deluged with fucking Olympic-related content. Why would you do this? For those that might counter and say, well, you do this because you're having SummerSlam in big stadiums, and as a result, you got to bend based off of when the NFL and the preseason gave. Nah, fuck that shit. This could have waited two or three weeks. They could have found a stadium that would have been able to host them. They could have found a way to make this work out with the NFL, or you go have SummerSlam somewhere else, like you figure something out. Or you start having SummerSlam in July. This is kind of stupid. I'm sorry, it was a little early for SummerSlam to me. And in addition, it's like, who really cares? You got the Olympics going on, even though I know it's in Paris, France, so it's tape delayed, and I've already watched the stuff live earlier in the day, just still. And then, and then, to come back and decide, Of all the goddamn places that you're going to have your big show of the summer, you're going to do it in Cleveland, Ohio. Cleveland, Ohio. Who does this? I think about all of the places in the United States that you associate with summer and Fun and exciting places to be. You know where's a place you never fucking think of? Cleveland. I've been there a number of times. The best thing about being in Cleveland is when you know very soon you're going to be leaving that some bitch. It's boring. It stinks. It smells. And there's differences. It both stinks and it smells. And can you imagine sitting there and saying to yourself, God, this is where you want to be. Now, maybe you could say with the WWE being there, it's the first time that um, something associated with skid marks football has gotten consent to be there. Ah, bad joke, bad joke. Um, But fucking Cleveland, man, of all the goddamn places. And even when Triple H and all of his regal holy splendor comes out at the beginning, And you can see him basking in it. Full ego mode, right? Oh, God. It's fantastic. But then, you see, it starts to singe his nostrils. And he comes to the realization that, oh, while it's an open-air stadium, which solves for the body odor of the male fans there and that fishy tuna smell of the female fans there, It doesn't solve for it because this is Cleveland and this city smells like shit. So that shit smell is coming from the outside into Skidmark Stadium and it smells like shit no matter where you go. Like all the matches, the return surprises, you wasted it on Cleveland. Cleveland! I guess. Joe Kim Noah said it right. Nobody sits there and says, I'm going to Cleveland for vacation. Like, fuck even the people that live in Cleveland. The dwindling amount that it continues to be over the last 90 years, they keep saying, we don't want to be here either. So why the fuck would WWE want to put their biggest show of the summer there? Do you want me to review the show or just knock on that third-rate city, the Detroit of Ohio and Cleveland? I guess I'll talk about SummerSlam. I mean, they went a bit crazy with the title swaps here, didn't they? Am I crazy or did every title except one switch hands here? Interesting. Felt kind of predictable in many senses. That doesn't always mean it's a bad thing. I just, I wonder, since I don't watch much of the TV product, whether that's Raw, which I basically watch about none of, and SmackDown that I watch very, very little of, 
and it's, it's mostly like highlights and clips on social media here and there to keep me up to date at least somewhat and that's about it i wonder sometimes if by me taking that approach right now with wrestling when i plug in to watch these premium live events does it help my enjoyment of the product or does it impede my enjoyment of the product and i'm not really sure i think i saw something where uncle dave said that this was an angle show. Yeah, I know, like, usually for a guy like him and his wrestling taste, he doesn't know what that means, right? Because he likes the shows that are about the flips and the kicks and the moves. He doesn't give a fuck about angles. He doesn't. Um, but that doesn't mean that's, that's a bad thing here. Like, there's some payoff to some things. You're advancing some stories. Like, that's kind of how it should be, right? I, I just don't know about this one. Like, you got the Women's World Championship. And I'm sure there are a lot of people going to talk about how much they enjoyed Rhea Ripley versus Liv Morgan. Pretty Dom. And, and, you know, he, he's doing his real dad proud once again. And, like, son of a bitch, call him Polly Dom. Do whatever the fuck you want to do. He should take them both. He's hardcore. Shout out Tommy Dreamer. Like, it's amazing. These are going out there and bumping and doing all their shit. And yet the thing you remember the most is what Dominic Mysterio did. It was his turn on Rhea. It's him cutting, cuddling, fucking getting right up with Liv Morgan. That's the thing that everybody remembers. Like, that's heat right there. Is he's going from Rhea to Liv and so many male wrestling fans, and frankly some female wrestling fans are like, fuck you. <laughs> that's, that's a heater right there. And Dom is like leading into this shit. Like Liv Morgan beats Rhea Ripley because of Dominic's turn, because of his help. And you know what? It's cool. Now you get to see something different with Rhea Ripley because clearly they're going in a different direction with Judgment Day, which feels like the dissolution of it, which I'll talk about in a little bit. Uh, the Intercontinental Championship. Something was just off with the vibe of this one. This match didn't go long, but yet it wasn't really a squash. Like, maybe this goes back to, hey, you should have had Braun Breaker win the last time. Like, to those people that say, well, you do, do, do good reasons. Well, you don't really point to this and say, well, yeah, that's why you didn't pull the trigger last time. In fact, this would point to and say, it was really stupid then for not to pull the trigger the fucking last time. There was just something off about it. This should have felt like a really, really big deal. And it just didn't. On the flip side, you look at the United States Championship L.A. Knight, Logan Paul, I thought this match delivered. I thought this match really worked. Logan Paul does his Logan Paul stuff in the ring. L.A. Knight needs to fucking win a big one. Finally wins a big one. If they didn't pull, it would have been really probably disastrous for his character because at some point in time, as much as people want to get behind certain talents and certain characters, they've got to feel like it's worthwhile. And if their guy is always losing at the biggest shows and in the biggest matches, at some point in time, they start to say, eh, I'm not going to get as invested in this person anymore. So it's the right decision. This worked. The vibe on this was good. Much better to me than Braun Breaker beating Sami Zayn for the IC title. Take that to what it means. Um, then you got the WWE Women's Championship. Nia Jax versus Bayley. I guess I didn't realize that we were back into pretending like Nia Jax is really good and a big deal again. And apparently we are. I would have thought maybe Bailey would have gotten a little more run with the title, but maybe you've done all you can with her. And, you know, on the flip side, I'll say, hey, not every champion needs to carry the strap a long time. Like, that's a, that's a, that could be a problem too, right? Is that you have too many champions carry a strap for too long, start to become boring, predictable, and all that jazz. So Nia Jax wins. Okay, whatever. Not really a big deal to me one way or another. Um, and as much as you want to talk about these other matches, it really feels like there were three matches on this card. It really, really does, right? You had Drew and CM Punk, and then you had the two men's world title matches. It felt like that was going to make or break this show. As far as Drew McIntyre versus CM Punk, you know, I tweeted this during the show on Saturday. My compliments to these two guys, in a sense, on how they can make us believe that they truly can't stand each other. And maybe this is one of these things where you work and you shoot and they kind of blend and there is some truth there and all of that. And that's great. It doesn't matter how much is true, how much is false. The bottom line is, is these two guys can make you believe. Now, I say all of that as a compliment 
and then realize, like, as this match goes along on Saturday, it becomes this serious angle that's about a friendship bracelet and what it represents, and oh my God, are you fucking kidding me? I guess you know what? It, it fucking works. Then so what? Um, you had some people, I think, talking about Seth Rollins being a distraction there. And maybe he was. I think it was okay, though, in the sense of maybe, right? Like, he doesn't like either guy. So, in theory, he could be fair and impartial. But he also serves as a way for CM Punk to lose his focus so he can lose the match. And it doesn't hurt him. Like, I don't know. Like, if somebody says he kind of distracted and in some ways overpowered it a little bit and took away the shine from where it should have been with McIntyre and Punk, maybe, right? Then you come back and kind of say, well, he adds to it, maybe. I could also say for as much of a heated feud as this felt like, like this should have been a street fight or something, right? And maybe you couldn't do that with the Bloodline Rules main event match, but... McIntyre and Punk just doing a regular wrestling match also didn't feel entirely appropriate. That's just me. But Drew wins, and it is what it is. Uh, the World Heavyweight Championship, Gunther and Damian Priest. So much for Keith Lee saying, well, I feel bad for Walter. I guess you shouldn't, huh? Um, and I guess the Judgment Day is no more. This has been working in the wings for quite a while, and the Finn Balor turn was really well done here. Really well done. Like They, 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 they pulled this off really well. Gunther as world heavyweight champion? Okay, sure. If anything, this is, serves as a good reminder of why I don't watch much and will continue to not watch very much because now we're going to have two, in my opinion, to me, boring-ass world champions. Just saying. But I guess if you're going to get needed to get the strap off of Priest, this is the way that you do it. And you send him and Balor off on their little program. And then we'll see where they go with Gunther from here. And even talking about that and saying like, hey, is the, probably the match you cared about the most. I'm not sure people cared about Gunther and Damian Priest. But at the end of the day, there's only one thing that people really gave a fuck about. And it was the main event, and in particular, whether a certain somebody was going to return or not. And we all knew Solo and Cody Rhodes, since this was Bloodline Rules, you had plenty of reasons to know, think you would know how it would go, and you're going to have people running and all of this, and certainly you did, right? Like, Arn, even te Arn Anderson even teased it backstage with Cody as he was walking out, or walking behind stage, whatever the fuck, because they just have to overdo everything with fucking Cody to try to force him down your goddamn throat. Arn's talking about you got some friends coming, and you know what? Here's Randy Orton, and here's Kevin Owens to fight off... Uh, Tama Tonga, Tonga Loa, whatever the fuck their names are. I don't care. Fatu. Like, you know what I mean? All of that. And I, I would wonder, like, with Fatu apparently hurting his ankle when he jumped on Rhodes on the table, um, you know, does that change the plans of how they did the, the close? And perhaps it did. Maybe it did, but it doesn't matter. Because at the end of the day, the real tribal chief is back. It's a shame it had to be wasted in Cleveland, but he's back, and that's what matters the fucking most. And you could just feel it. You could just feel the difference in the environment. You could feel the excitement level permeate through that skin mark stadium as they realize, oh my God, a real main eventer, a real major star, a real top dog, if you will, is fucking back. And the way they did this with him going after Solo, and you knew you could see that was coming. And it's like kind of this layered storytelling that WWE used to do years and years ago that they really haven't been very good at in recent years. But now it's coming back a little bit in terms of Roman's got this story with Solo and they're going to be going here for a little bit. But Cody, don't forget about me. And at some point in time, you're just a placeholder bitch and I'm going to come back and take what's mine. Like this finish, outstanding. Thank God. Throw up the ones. Roman Reigns is back. Yes, it's more bloodline shit. Yes, it's going to continue on, probably through WrestleMania. We'll just have to deal with it. But at least Roman is fucking back. And if nothing else, when it comes to this show, that is something to be excited about.
because they needed him back. And he's back as a baby face too. And that's going to be interesting to see how they do this, right? But you could feel it. You could sense it. You know it. The fans are ready to really be behind Roman Reigns. They want to like Roman Reigns now. They want to cheer Roman Reigns now. They want to see him come back and kick the shit out of Solo and this faux-ass bloodline. So looking forward to seeing where that goes in the future. Most importantly of all, nobody's really given a fuck about Cody Rhodes and where he's going next. I'm kidding. Who gives a fuck at this point, honestly? Um, Yeah, like it's an angle show. That's not a bad thing. I just... I don't come away with a ton to really be super excited about or criticize when it comes to the show. Feels like it just kind of rides the middle. And I'll just focus on the big positive, which is, thank God, our real tribal chief is back. 